Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Randy Rossi. Uh, I've been a software developer for uh, over 26 years now. Um, I was here about four years ago where I did a presentation on uh, BMC64, which is a fork of Vice I created uh, optimized for the Raspberry Pi 2 and 3. Um, my first computer was a VIC-20. I uh, grew up with Commodore computers, used uh, Amigas, uh, Commodore 64s, Commodore 128s. Uh, so they're near and dear to my heart. Um, and for whatever reason, I decided one day to try and replicate uh, the VIC-2 uh, 6567, 6569 chips uh, in the Commodore 64. Um, so what is the VIC-2? That's the video chip. It stands for Video Interface Chip. Uh, in the Commodore 64, it sits right about there, depending on the motherboard version. Uh, it comes in a 40-pin uh, dual inline package. Um, it has a 320 by 200 uh, resolution, 16 colors. I'm sure you're familiar with the specs. Um, and it's also responsible for things like DRAM refresh and providing uh, a CPU clock. Um, so there are a couple different versions of uh, the chip depending on what region you're in. So there's NTSC and PAL. There was also another one, I think, out of Argentina, which is kind of a hybrid of the two. Um, I chose to focus on mostly the bread bin 6567, 6569 uh, chips, but I'll probably take a look at the, uh, the other ones or the, uh, the ones that were typically found in 64Cs. Um, over the years, developers have learned to take advantage of a lot of the glitches of these chips and they really pushed it to the limits and the demos that they came out with were just visually very impressive for uh, a 1 megahertz 8-bit machine. Uh, they did things that were just not thought possible, uh, but they are getting old, um, released in 1982. So why did I take this project on? One day I, I turned on uh, one of my machines and I saw this, it was like a pink screen and obviously it was in the middle of failing. And uh, sometimes they just go and you get a black screen, you get nothing. Uh, and sometimes, you know, some, something in there is just uh, through fatigue, you know, they heat up, they get quite hot, heat up and cool down repeatedly, eventually they'll, they'll fail. Um, so this prompted me to start looking uh, for um, other projects out there. There were a number of different hardware replacement projects out there, like for the PLA, for SID, now for DRAM, I think there's one for um, the 6510. Um, so I started searching around to see if anybody had done it. I found one unfinished project called FAL 6567. I'm not sure if it ever got past simulation phase, um, but uh, I, I took a look at that and it kind of inspired me to try something myself. At this point, I wasn't, I wasn't interested or even knew if I could make something into a product. This was just something that I took on myself as a hobby project. But the real reason is the 64 Sparks Joy. That's why I did this. So I don't know if you remember Marie Kondo. She had a Netflix series that said if you want to eliminate clutter in your life, you only keep the things that spark joy. And that's why I have 10 Commodore 64s. <laughs> Uh, so what is the VIC-2 doing? Well, it's uh, at one level, it's doing something very simple. It's repeating forever in a loop. Um, there are uh, That's the clock cycle or the, the clock of the CPU. Every up and down that you see there, uh, it's a voltage up, voltage down. That's a clock cycle. It's doing about 63 cycles, depending on the version of the chip, per raster line. And it's doing the same thing over and over again. It's uh, fetching sprite pointers, fetching sprite data if it's time to load. The sprite data and display it, uh, reading character pointers, reading character pixel data from ROM, uh, again depending on the graphics mode, um, but it's also refreshing DRAM, so DRAM is organized into rows and columns, and uh, it, unless you refresh those rows, they kind of forget what they're supposed to be remembering, so the, the VIC chip is constantly sweeping through those rows and refreshing uh, the DRAM so they don't forget. There are idle cycles in there, um, it's also sharing the data bus between the CPU and the VIC, so they kind of take turns on the high and low cycles. Um, and every once in a while, the VIC will stun the CPU, the 6510 CPU, because it wants to have a few extra cycles to do some, some more work, and we call those uh, bad lines. Um, it's generating lumen and chroma signals that come out the rear of the machine. Um, it's also sending these RAS-CAS pulses to multiplex the row and address lines. And again, it's generating the CPU clock. So it's actually doing uh, quite a bit. My Bible for this project was this text file that was released in uh, 
August of 1996 called the MOS 6567659 video controller and its application in the Commodore 64. It's, it's just a great document describing the inner workings of, uh, of the VIC-2. Uh, so how do you go about and replicate something like this? Well, these days you use an FPGA. Uh, now, I'm not going to get into all the details about how FPGAs work because I have no idea how they work. I really don't. I have a very, very high level, naive understanding of how these things work. This is a bird's eye view of an FPGA. You have these pre-made logic blocks in here uh, that can be connected together. You specify how they're connected get together. Um, and uh, you have these laneways and, and you can get signals from outside the FPGA in or from inside out through pads. Um, you know, I took a couple of digital logic courses in, in university. I barely remember this stuff, but I remember you start off with gates, you know, simple gates and or not gates. And from there, you can build up more uh, higher level functions like latches, adders, and flip flops. And then from there, you can build up even higher level functions like lookup tables and multiplexers. But you have to remember that when you're working with an FPGA, um, you're actually building a circuit. There's no instruction set. You're not like programming it. You're actually specifying some uh, circuit on how it should behave. Um, and how do, you, how do you do that? How do you specify what circuit it should be? You use a, a, a hardware definition language like Verilog, and I chose Verilog for this project. So this is an example of what's called a, a process block. And what this is saying is at the rising edge of this pixel clock, do the following. And the thing about um, Verilog, I, I kind of, it's, it's very different than a language like you program in C, C++, Java, where you have uh, instruction that are sequentially executed. There's an instruction set. You're doing one thing after another. I kind of think of Verilog as going left to right instead of top to bottom because everything kind of executes. I might, word, I might use the word execute, but that's probably not the right word in this context. Um, this is all, you know, it's, it's just triggered simultaneously. So all the process blocks that you put together are all happening all at the same time. So for example, those three statements, H pause, uh, H bar, and H edge, those would not happen one after another. They just happen all at the same time. So you just have to keep that in mind when you're working with, uh, with this kind of um, uh, architecture system. Um, so the, the general plan here was, okay, get an FPGA. Uh, you're gonna have to build some support circuitry around it in the 64 and maybe let's try and, and put something together. Um, so I bought one of these um, development boards. So the FPGA manufacturers, they, they produce these development boards because they want you to try and test out their system and test out your design. And they do a lot of that support circuitry for you. Uh, in this case, there's a nice convenient uh, USB connection. There are buttons on there, LEDs, and they break out the pins. Um, and you can, this one is actually breadboard. We can stick it into breadboard and start to play around with it. So I got one of these CMOD A7 uh, FPGAs and uh, I went online, or sorry, before I went online, I, I came up with this general plan of uh, using an FPGA, but for the time being, I didn't, I didn't know how to generate composite signals, uh, Luma and Chroma signals, so I just kind of offloaded that to an off-the-shelf chip. It was a Sony IC that took in RGB signals and uh, would, would produce the Chroma Luma signals for you. So I just kind of uh, put that aside, but then I realized that I was going to, like the, the thing that's different on this project with other um, FPGA implementations of the VIC, like it has been implemented before in things like the Ultimate 64 and the Mister. Uh, I was going to have to deal with a real data bus, a real address bus, real DRAM, uh, real timing requirements, um, and that was going to be a challenge. Uh, so I knew I was going to have to have some sort of uh, bi-directional bus transfer going on in there. Um, so I went online and I found a video or I, uh, an article called uh, Building a Vid Video Controller. It's just a pair of counters. Sounds so easy, right? Uh, <laughs> and uh, I put together this circuit using that, that uh, development board. That bottom half of the circuit there came straight from the data sheet. It just said, build this. And I did that. And uh, those long lines that you see there, um, the yellow and brown, that's the, uh, the red, green, and blue signals. I chose to keep it simple at first two bits for every uh, color channel. There's also a couple of uh, horizontal and vertical sync signals going in there. That's what the chip uh, wants to, 
to receive, and I just wired up the output of that chip right to my monitor. I took their, uh, their sample Verilog, which was really only a few lines of, of Verilog. It was actually quite simple um, from, from that level. And I changed the X and Y resolution to match the 64 resolution. Um, I put in a little border um, uh, limits saying if the border was between, or if the pixel was between you know, this and 50 pixels, and then you have the 320 area, and then the, the right-hand side and the top and the bottom. And I uh, just changed the color, and I got this. I got this nice little, you know, kind of 64-looking uh, display. Obviously, there's there's nothing there. It's not talking anything. But that was the beginning of this project. At this point, again, it's just uh, out of interest, trying to get this thing to see if I could uh, interface with a real 64. Um, so I realized that I couldn't go. I couldn't iterate over hardware. You can't flash the development board. Uh, and try it out and then go back to your code and flash. It's just that cycle is way too long. So you have to, you have to simulate um, this the kind of thing to, to iterate rapidly. And uh, I did something, I guess, uh, a little quirky here. I, I found, so there's a, a program called Verilator. And what Verilator does is it takes your Verilog and it will compile, uh, use, it will change it to a C program that you compile and run on your desktop. And uh, it simulates that circuit. It's very slow, but um, it will simulate the circuit as though it's running on the FPGA. And as long as you set the inputs and you read the outputs, then it's, it behaves just like it would on the FPGA. And I wrote uh, that bottom to that bottom uh, right rectangle with the uh, the blue screen. That's the same Verilog core that you saw running on the real hardware, but running in my simulated environment. And I, I wrote a, kind of a fake display um, that would interpret the pixel uh, for every pixel that it's outputting, it would draw that into a frame buffer and then show that in a window. So I had that running, and I decided to use uh, Vice, the versatile Commodore emulator, because a lot of work went into making its emulated VIC-2 very accurate. And it kind of got reverse engineered from the real thing, and over the years, it just, I, I'm not aware of anything that that emulated VIC-2 can't do. Um, so I wrote my own uh, bridge between my verilated FPGA core and Vice. I found the right spots in Vice to step my FPGA every half cycle. And at the end of every half cycle, the FPGA would transmit its internal state back into my custom Vice code, and it would compare the state between Vice's emulator, or emulated uh, VIC, and my actual FPGA code. And if there was a mismatch in there, it would say, here's something that's wrong. This is exactly the cycle, uh, a half cycle, that you need to pay attention to to, to fix it. So uh, this worked out pretty well. Um, and I'm skipping over you know, like a few months of development here. But uh, I did, the first thing I did was I implemented the border change uh, register, or the background, uh, the, yeah, the border change uh, color register. So I wrote a little program. And all I did is toggle it and uh, initiated the sync. And I was getting the same pattern on my simulated FPGA core as I was in Vice. And that, that gave me the confidence to keep, keep going at this. Uh, so I implemented, um, next thing I did is implement text mode. Now you see that the text actually shows up on the FPGA simulated environment. That's because I was transmitting, when, when the FPGA wanted to read from the data bus, in my VIC, uh, sorry, in my Vice custom code, I would actually set the data uh, the data uh, lines to be whatever the emulated memory was said that they should be from Vice. So this is actually my FPGA simulated uh, core reading from Vice's memory. And uh, so I got text mode working. Then uh, the cool thing about this is I could run pretty much any software program on the 64 and tell it, okay, go and sync. And, and then I could tell whether the, the pixels matched, I would do a visual comparison, and I also had a comparison uh, at the cycle, half cycle level, telling me that things were, were working or not. Um, and then I could run uh, demos and kind of freeze frame on a, a particular spot that they're, they're using uh, these glitches. Like this is a, 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 a frame from Coma Land, and they're doing a lot of Y scroll bad line tricks in there to get the, uh, the, the slanted uh, colors. There's a color mismatch in here, but uh, the pixel for pixel is actually uh, a good match. So I was confident this was working, and, and I thought, 
okay, I developed this out for a while. There's no sprites at this point, but uh, it, was, it was time to try real hardware. So I took that same circuit and uh, put in those buffers, those trans, uh, transceivers, and I just jammed the, uh, jammed the, uh, the jumper cables right into the socket. And it was a big mess. Uh, but, um, and, and I don't know if you're like, electricity does not like to travel this way. There's no, <laughs> there's no ground plane backing that. It doesn't like to hop in, in, into the air. So it's very, the, the, the signals were very noisy, but fortunately the 64 is very forgiving uh, in this regard. Um, and I hooked this up to uh, my 64. That first slide is what uh, I got at one point. It's, that's what happens when you get your row and column addresses backwards. So it was reading memory, but it was not reading the right, <laughs> the right memory. Uh, some troubleshooting uh, for a few days. I got some cartridges to work. I could plug in some cartridges. I would get a black, uh, black screen, but I would hear the music playing. Uh, and then finally, I got the blue screen of life. And uh, my, my, uh, my um, replica was, was working. Uh, and that, that was one of the most satisfying uh, moments of the project when I actually had something right. And it was working quite well, given that, uh, that it was just a bunch of jump, jumper wires um, going through air. So I iterated on this for uh, many months, uh, just way, way too much time that I cared to, <laughs> to talk about. I ended up adding sprites in there. I, I had to um, program in the, the glitches, so I had to kind of make this, the, my replica fail in the same way as the genuine thing. Maybe it's not quite a failure, but they act uh, in a kind of a predictable way that were um, that developers took took advantage of. One of the the craziest um, that I came across was this sprite crunch, where you could you could make a sprite uh, kind of expand um, both horizontally and vertically. It's just this weird glitch that they took advantage of. That first frame is from a demo called Lunatico, and um, there's some crazy stuff going on there. That that really caused me some grief uh, to get that to work. There are a bunch of black pixels in the background and there are sprite collisions happening with every frame and if all the collisions don't happen exactly the right time then it just it just renders horribly. So um, so I just iterated like this. Um, eventually I realized I had to abandon uh, the, the breadboard and kind of start spending a little bit of money um, and, and time learning how to make uh, a PCB out of this. Um, so before I jumped into a custom PCB, I ended up switching over to a different FPGA development board. This is kind of one generation before this, the, uh, the FPGA that I was using. That first FPGA was just way overpowered for this project. It was probably 10 times larger than what I needed. Even this one, you could argue, is, is larger. Um, and uh, this one, uh, again, it handles all the voltage uh, issues, um, uh, voltage regulator, this easy flash. I built this uh, custom PCB to replace all those wires and, and transceivers. The idea here was to kind of make an FPGA sandwich and uh, that is like a custom hat that I built for this uh, FPGA development board. So I would just break, put one, put uh, populate the uh, the rows there with uh, female, or, sorry, male headers and just plug it in and then the bottom socket would just plug into the, uh, the Commodore 64. So I put that together. I had this fabricated for me uh, by PCB Way. They did a pretty good job, and there it is, sitting in, inside the uh, 64. Instead of running the RGB out to my my uh, composite encoder, I just bought one of these off-the-shelf HDMI uh, translators. It does the same thing. It takes red, green, and blue, and then you get a uh, convenient HDMI signal. And that actually helped because uh, Pixel Perfect Display helped me uh, find uh, problems uh, more easily rather than on a, funny, a fuzzy uh, CRT. At this point, I, I named the project Kawari. Um, it means substitute replacement in Japanese. Uh, and I just needed a project code name for this. Um, so, okay, that I had a working <laughs> core at this point. Um, this wasn't a work project, so there was no one to rein me in here and stop me <laughs> from doing some crazy things. And uh, I'm not sure if anybody's gonna use these uh, extra features, but there are some that are targeted for a general audience and some that are targeted for 8-bit uh, enthusiasts. So at the very least, I kind of built what I wanted out of something that was going to plug into um, the 64 because what I had essentially was an FPGA development board with a Commodore 64 uh, bus interface. And you can do some pretty cool things at that point. 
Um, I wanted at least to be able to switch between PAL and NTSC, and not, not even just through a hardware switch, but through software, just to do a few pokes or maybe a utility program that would just change my machine to be PAL. Uh, you know, growing up in NTSC land, all the cool demos were, were PAL because you have extra cycles um, and the timing was, uh, was more suited for, um, uh, that, that, for the demo scene. Um, FPGAs come with block RAM, so you might as well add another 64K of RAM. If you have more RAM, why not add some graphics modes? <laughs> it's actually quite simple. Uh, once you have this all set up, Adding a new graphics mode is just a few lines of Verilog, so it's very tempting to try that out. And I was uh, saying, well, if I have new graphics modes, why not an 80-column screen? And, uh, and I just kept going on like that, uh, changing colors. Yeah, sure, the colors are fixed on a regular 64, but why not let people change the colors, even programmatically? So if you want to change colors for your game or your application, you could do that. Um, I had, ended up adding math registers, DMA transfer, and then I, I started... Uh, going with the, the um, different options for video because now that you have control over the video signals at their source, you can export them out of the device in different ways, like analog RGB, like what I was doing, or even uh, DVI signal. So, um, so this was just major, this, this probably added another year to the project. Uh, and and uh, yeah, like I said, it's just kind of a crazy uh, path that I went down. Um, so video options, I finally figured out how to generate Luma and Chroma signals from an FPGA. It's, it's actually not that difficult. It's much more difficult to uh, decode those signals, but that's the, the job of the CRT. Um, and I ended up writing my own um, composite uh, settings editor. So this is kind of the, you, you, you might, I, I knew I wasn't going to get these values right. I wanted to give people the option of changing them if it didn't look good on their displays. Uh, so you can actually change the luma, phase, and amplitude. It's a different color model than RGB. It's kind of like um, you have the luma signal that, that determines the uh, brightness of the pixel, and then the phase and amplitude is kind of like specifying the uh, distance and angle on a color wheel. And uh, that's not something that's very intuitive, but you can kind of see, if you see the color wheel that represents those uh, those values, then it kind of makes more sense. Um, so that that worked out pretty well. Um, but like I said, you have these red, green, and blue raw values. You might as well get them out of the FPGA. Uh, it's actually a very straightforward uh, process. You have a resistor ladder. I chose six bits for every color channel. That's overkill because that gives you 18 bits of uh, colors, uh, which is you don't need that, but why not, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I exported the sync signals. So you can actually hook up um, to these signals a 1084 monitor or a VGA monitor and just get, and you don't have the, um, the, um, the jail bars that you usually get with the uh, chroma luma signals. It's just a nice clean <coughs> display. So I wanted that in there. Uh, this is the same kind of editor that I had uh, for the luma chroma. Um, sides, except now you have more familiar red, green, and blue intensity values. And uh, there, I think there are a, a few different presets that you can cycle through and, and kind of change things to, to be your preference. Uh, and then this is another uh, video option, which I kind of regret, which caused me so much frustration. Actually, this whole project was an exercise in frustration at every level. Um, I, I tried to fool around with uh, exporting uh, DBI signals. And on the Spartan 6, this was actually pretty straightforward. It wasn't, um, uh, they, they, came, they have a, um, a pre-made, uh, I guess, DVI encoder that, that is just freely available. You can stick that into your core. Uh, and the Spartan 6 outputs the right electrical standard, which is TMDS. And uh, um, it, it's fewer wires. So in, in the uh, previous example with red, green, and blue, you have 18, 20, 20 pins to get that signal out. Here you only have eight pins, and it's using differential signaling and all sorts of, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a crazy uh, technology to get um, to serialize uh, this digital signal out, but it actually did work. Um, so I mentioned the 80 column mode. This is something that um, I just kind of did. I, I, this was another experiment of mine. I, I realized that I had um, 
a higher dot clock than the actual 64. The 64 has like a roughly eight megahertz dot clock, but it's doing something like 520 by 262. But in order to get those other resolutions like BGA or DVI, you kind of have to double the, the vertical resolution to get the right range in horizontal uh, refresh rate. Otherwise, you don't get a signal. And I had also doubled the dot clock on the X axis. And I realized that, well, I, I have, so I have a four times dot clock I can actually stick in a 640 by 200 resolution in there. You might as well throw in a, an 80 column uh, mode in there. And this is actually a true 80 column text mode. It's not a graphics mode like what you, like you could install some programs on the 64 that used um, kind of half character um, uh, cells. And, and there were different ways of doing it using character mode or graphics mode, but they were slow and they had limitations. This is a full 80 column actual text mode. It actually uses hardware accelerated scrolling and uh, block copy and fill routines. So it's actually quicker to scroll on the 80 column screen than it is on the 40 column screen, even though it's moving uh, twice as much data. Um, I took the, the way that I, I got this to work is I took the kernel's car in and car out routines. And I basically just rewrote them with the different uh, limit, with 40 column limit changed to 80 column limit. and poking my new registers to get the characters to the screen. And that worked out pretty well. You can boot into basic and it works pretty much just like the 40 column screen. Um, and uh, you can even run some, some old pet programs that were, were made for, uh, for that uh, with. Um, so that worked out pretty well. Uh, and I also got a, a message from um, somebody who was following my project. I was video blogging this, uh, this whole project and they said, hey, you might as well run a, uh, or you might as well write a, a terminal program or a terminal driver for uh, Novaterm because Novaterm had this capability of putting in different drivers and there was already a driver for this, the Commodore 128 VDC chip. I took that code and then just again rewrote it to poke into my registers and do the equivalent and I got a nice uh, 80 column uh, screen for, I, I don't have much, uh, much to show there because I couldn't connect to a VBS in there but you can actually run um, you can actually connect to BBSs online uh, through a Wi-Fi cartridge, and since you can control the colors, uh, you can install ANSI colors and just have a right, uh, a correct uh, ANSI display. Um, this, so my 80 column mode is actually very similar to the BBC on the 128. I stole their uh, idea of having the upper four bits on the color to be used for underline, blinking, um, alternate character set, and something else. I can't remember what the other one was. Um, so it's very similar in that in, in capability. So I uh, spent lots of time and money uh, designing some custom boards. That was the first iteration using the uh, Spartan 6. Um, and that was put together for, uh, for me by PCB Way. Worked pretty well. Um, I eventually uh, designed my own PCB based on the Spartan 6. Uh, I switched packages, but it's the same family of uh, FPGAs. And uh, that one on the right was my, what I thought my final design was. Um, now, just when I thought I was done, <laughs> when I finally woke up from my, uh, my cave, I realized that uh, due to supply chain issues and due, due to the pandemic, the FPGA I had chosen was no longer available or it was so expensive. Uh, there was some price gouging going on there. I think some companies just just hoarded a lot of them and they were selling them. They were trying to sell what was an FPGA for uh, $12 for $80 or $100 or more. And that just made, you know, this, it's not no longer viable to even expect anyone to do that, but um, it's something that's possible. Um, so other project ideas, maybe I'll write a Geos driver in 640 by 200 mode. Um, you, so there are certain video modes in the VIC that are illegal, uh, certain combinations of the registers, you just get a black screen. Well, there's an opportunity now to make them legal modes and you would actually have them um, uh, driven by DRAM, not my new video, my new video modes are driven by the, the block RAM, uh, but you could add uh, other video modes if you wanted to. Um, you could add super sprites, huge sprites uh, if you wanted to, write, write new basic extensions, rewrite some kernel routines for graphics features, and uh, one thing that I ended up doing in my demo is, uh, and one thing that's interesting, I think, or fun about this project is you can take existing Commodore 64 programs that were written many years ago 
and kind of tweak them just a little bit to make them just a little bit better. So I found, for example, uh, a program that um, rendered the Mandelbrot set in, in kind of blocky low res, but uh, and I just replaced um, the multiplication routine with my math registers, and it sped it up like you know four or five times. So and and it's just something fun to play with. I found the uh, the source code for Elite, the, the game video, uh, the video game Elite, and I was thinking of doing the same thing. There's there's some math routines in there. Maybe just change them and see if I can get a faster frame rate and and have a a, a better Elite version of Elite. Um, so. Yeah, final notes. The core is open source, um, so you can take a look at it. There's a lot of good stuff in there if you're into Verilog and hardware stuff. Uh, there's a, there are solutions in there to generate Luma Chroma signals, uh, flash update your hard, uh, their flash update your flash chips EEPROM controller. Um, it's probably a good starting place to build uh, a VIC original VIC replacement. People have asked me that uh, if I'm gonna if I plan on doing that. Not anytime soon. I'm gonna take a breather from this project, uh, but it is it is a good starting place. Uh, my guess is it would take maybe six months to actually put that together, given all the uh, open source uh, code that I've put up there. Uh, so uh, I have two, or there, sorry, there are two places you can get uh, the Quarry boards. Um, my Shopify site. Uh, I'm actually sold out of the mini. I have a batch of large boards coming in soon. Um, the, the mini boards are available from videogameperfection.com, and he's also getting uh, large boards ready soon. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions or comments? Do you have any here today that we could talk No, I didn't register as a vendor uh, uh, here. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, like I said, I'm sold out of the mini. The, uh, the large boards uh, were delayed, so I don't have those anyway. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. Oh. I'll order from that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know it would have been nice to have them here um, to save. Yeah, yeah, sure. Do you recommend a good time to start learning very long? Sorry, good. Uh, recommend a time to start learning very long? Oh boy, uh, I don't know of any good primers. I I just kind of in my case just just dove into just it. Dig. Yeah, yeah. Just, just dig. Yeah. Primers? Thank you. That was fun. Yeah, you could do that. Micro, micro HDMI. It's a micro oh, HDMI. HDMI. Yeah. And you yeah. just break that out to something on the pie. Screw in the back of the you know, I thought that Yeah, so if you have if you have an ARC <laughs> modulator that's been removed, then that <laughs> opens up it's, holes it's in the back a, that you could fish a cable out to the machine. You could just so, cut a hole now to HDMI. You could cut a hole, yeah. yeah. If you want to cut holes, right? Yeah. I don't recommend cutting holes, but uh, if you if you want to do that again. Any reason why a log instead of VHDL? Uh, not really. It was just it just looked more friendly to me. Yeah, yeah. It looked less intimidating because, like I said, I, did, I didn't know anything about programmable logic, uh, and uh, it looked more. It looked closer to what something uh, it looked familiar to me. That's why I chose it. Just so you know, vendor tables are fairly flexible around here. Oh, okay. So if you did show up with a box of them, yeah, there's an extra always an extra table. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so that was, uh, <laughs> Good, don't yeah. like you have to plan that it hits around. Yeah, <laughs> just so you know, you get to flash it. Yes. How do you flash it? You flash it by running a program on the 64. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was thinking of putting up a, uh, okay. a sample of that, but it's just a regular 64 program. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you can it yeah. it'll fit on depending on the version four or five discs. You can actually flash it from a 1541 drive, and you just swap the disks or a single or, or, SD, or SD2 IEC or high 1541, okay. or even real 1541 drives. You, it, I mean, I've, I've never done that, but it will work. So it's like the arch that is flashable through a program on the college. Yeah, so I realized I, I would never have gotten it 100% correct, and I knew I had to have some solution to, to update it in the field. So, uh, so yeah, you can. They're both the same way you do it. No, no, well, they're different <laughs> versions of firmware. Yeah, 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 yeah,